Good evening and welcome to Spokane City Council. I'd like to start with the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are on the unceded land of the Spokane people and that these lands were once the major trading center for the Spokanes as they share this place and welcome other area tribes through their relations, history, trade, and ceremony. We also want to acknowledge that the land holds the spirit of the place through its knowledge, culture, and all the original people since time immemorial. As we take a moment to consider the impacts of colonization, may we also acknowledge the strengths and resiliency of the Spokanes and their relatives. As we work together making decisions that benefit all, may we do so as one heart, one mind, and one spirit. We are grateful to be on the shared lands of the Spokane people and ask for the support of their ancestors in all relations. We ask that you recognize these injustices that forever change the lives of the Spokane people and all their relatives. We agree to work together to stop all acts of continued injustices toward Native Americans and all our relatives. It is time for reconciliation. We must act upon the truths and take actions that will create restorative justice for all. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flags of the United States of America. To the republic for, to the republic stands, for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, under God with indivisible, with, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Nailed Fister, it. will you call the roll? Council President Wilkerson? Present. Council Member Sapone? Here. Council Member Cathcart? Present. Council Member Bingle? Here. Council Member Dillon? Here. Council Member Klitsky? Present. Council Member Navarrete? Here. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. Thank you. This evening, we are going to start out with a report from the Office of the Ombuds, and we're going to have Mr. Barklow come on up. Welcome. Do you want to raise that if you like? You can elevate the platform if you like. Button on your right side if you want it. That'll go up or down if you want it. Let's maybe less moving parts is better. <laughs> hey, good evening, city council members, Thank council you. president. Thanks for having us. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you tonight to brief the OPO's 2023 annual report, which fulfills the requirements of SMC 04.32.100. Um, my brief tonight will provide some complaint data information as well as provide some analysis on some of the work that we did uh, over this last year. To close, I'll discuss some of the themes we're currently working on. For the sake of time, this brief does not cover every chart or every stat that's in those annual reports. We have uh, delivered you hard copies of those re reports. We've sent you an email copy of those reports. We have hard copies outside of this room, and we will publish these online um, probably tomorrow for those uh, members of the public who might be looking for them. Uh, I want to take a moment to thank you uh, for your support in the ordinance that brings our office into compliance with Washington State's and Spokane's emphasis on using gender neutral terms. I may mess this up from time to time myself. I'm used to using the word ombudsman, but moving forward, we'll try to use the word ombuds as we move forward. So I also want to thank you for funding our initiative to create a more secure workspace which will allow for greater privacy to complaints and instant review. I think you know our staff, but here's uh, some, our photo page. Uh, I serve as the police ombuds. Louie May serves as the deputy police ombuds. Christina serves as our executive assistant, and Tim Zamlin has been assigned from the city attorney's office as our legal counsel. So for OPO activities, this chart summarizes most of the numbers on our, uh, that we've we did last year. Our citizen contacts and inter interviews related to a potential complaint both increased last year uh, as compared to 2022. In 2023, we're, we were contacted by community members 1,820 times. Uh, it's, it's just a slight increase from 2022, less than 100, but more than 370 more times than we were contacted in 2021. 
uh, our OPO-generated complaints increased by 13%, uh, but we also saw a slight decrease in referrals. We saw a substantial increase in the number of accommodations for SPD uh, with 17 accommodations, more than double from the previous year. Casework-wise, overall, our numbers are up. We provided oversight of 94 internal affairs interviews, which is more than double from 2023 or 2022. We certified 88 cases as compared to 70 uh, in 2022, and we declined to certify three cases, which remain the same. None of those declinations, though, were due to the quality of the investigations. They were due to a timeliness issue, a routing issue, and then a labor agreement issue. Uh, we began working with City Legal last year regarding some of those issues brought up by 270 regarding their, um, their members, which also work in the police department. Um, and so more to follow on that moving forward. Overall, I think these numbers show that we have a pretty good working relationship with SPD. We have pretty good access to uh, the things that we need to provide oversight of, and uh, we're moving forward. Special cases, uh, they remain stable, but these cases are, are um, use of force reviews, collisions, pursuits, those sorts of things. Um, they provide a substantial amount of time, and then we also go to review boards regarding those cases. Uh, meetings or significant contacts with SPD remained pretty robust. We had more than 400 of those last year uh, alone, and we also conducted one mediation, which should handle that slide. So for outreach, uh, we focus our, our outreach in three areas, locally, at the state level, and then nationally if we can. Uh, we attended more than 75 uh, local events, which included the basic law enforcement academy graduations, work groups, SCAR events, National Night Out, and Unity in the Community. I was also asked to be a, a guest on the Skill Skins Good Gab podcast. Uh, we also participated in uh, the Basic Law Enforcement Academy uh, mock scenes as actors, in which we get to see in real-time access uh, what's being taught and how it's being retained by officers who are about to, to leave the academy. At the state level, I've continued to work as a commissioner for the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission. My work through the CJTC has been informative on how the state will regulate policing, uh, particularly through the officer decertification process. Sitting through a few of those hearings, I've been able to take back many learning lessons that SPD can benefit from to ensure we do the best possible investigations. For example, it became clear in a recent decertification hearing that CJTC is much more likely to open up a new investigation in situations where local investigations are limited, less than thorough, or are non-existent. I was able to witness firsthand an agency's frustrations regarding a CJTC investigation, even though it became quite clear that they had not conducted an, an investigation into the matter themselves. So to bring it home, it just emphasizes why we need to do the work ourselves. Uh, we can ask the questions and be as thorough, and uh, I think it has just increased buy-in at all levels for why we do the things that we do. Nationally, we had various opportunities to provide oversight assistance. Last year, we provided assistance to Pierce County, Washington, Marin County, California, North Miami PD in Florida, and New Orleans, Louisiana. I also serve on the board of directors for the National Association of Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. Training-wise, we continue to fulfill our requisite training with SPD uh, by attending in-service training opportunities as well as uh, conducting ride-alongs. Uh, both Louie May and I did two of those. This year we have uh, a full contingent of commissioners and we are knocking ride-alongs out, seems like monthly. So a lot more access with the police department um, and that's good. We're able to attend the International Associations of Chiefs of Police Annual Conference, as well as the NACL Conference. At last year's NACL Conference, uh, I was on the panel with President Dave Duncan from the Spokane Police Guild, as well as Nick Mitchell, who is the independent monitor for the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. It was the first time a union president was on a panel with an oversight practitioner, and it was well received nationally um, by practitioners from all over the country. The audience asked many questions on how they could create a working relationship with their union counterparts. I hope to use this as 
capital with the police guild and momentum of change in, le in leadership with the city and SPD to finally fix the parts of the guild contract that removed the items the OPO requested in the last bargaining cycle. For reporting, the OPO issued 12 monthly reports, five closing reports with 13 recommendations. The underlying, the underlying theme in the closing reports were complying with policy that directs cases be referred to internal affairs when there is potential misconduct, as well as uh, the administrative review category and the chain of command review process. I'll leave the recommendations for Commissioner Jasmine, who will discuss those as part of his presentation. The next section will break down the commendations we received and sent to SPD as, and then go into complaints and referrals. For commendations, we've really tried to emphasize commendations as part of the process of oversight. We've changed our complaint form to emphasize commendations. We specifically moved the word commendation uh, before complaints, uh, as well as we created, and these are out there as well, uh, how to file a compliment with the OPO uh, for the public. So a little bit more emphasis. We're not just about complaint work. We need to be balanced on both sides. And there's a lot of good stuff happening out there that uh, officers and the police department should be recognized for. So last year, we submitted 17 commendations. As you can see from the graph, 44% came from the OPO for ride-alongs. However, 56% of the commendations came from the community members who had a positive interaction. So a few examples include accommodation for an officer and a chaplain who helped the community member after the relative was found deceased. Uh, we also received accommodation on an officer who helped a tourist navigate their way out of the city during the Lilac Parade. I don't even know if I could get out of the city during the Lilac Parade, so th that's something. Uh, overall, the five-year complaint trend, uh, complaints have continued on a downward trend. In the previous years, 2021 was the lowest number of community complaints we've received with 64. In 2023, we received 65 community complaints. Internal complaints have also been declining. There were 18 complaints uh, in 2021, and in 2023, there were 12. So if you combine both community and internal complaints, uh, 77 complaints were generated in 2023. And you can see by the, uh, that top line, the blue one, that this is the lowest number of complaints received in the last five years. So I think that's worth mentioning and pausing on for just a moment. So for the complaint analysis, this table illustrates the top 10 allegations made in complaints. Inadequate response and demeanor as has been in every year since I've arrived here, have been uh, our highest two categories in which the public makes the most complaints. Aside from those, the public complained most about biased policing and excessive force. While there were numerous allegations made, six of 34 allegations warranted a chain of command review, and 27 of 34 were closed or administratively suspended, and one was mediated. Most internal complaints fell under the standard or policy violations category. It's a catch-all category, um, but it includes examples of uh, insubordination, mishandling of evidence, falsification of records, prohibited speech, and off-duty uh, actions. Uh, for discipline, 9% of community-generated complaints and 50% of internal complaints received a finding uh, with discipline associated with it. Uh, the most common finding was none because the officer was either exonerated or the allegation was not sustained or the complaint was unfounded. The most common sanction issued was a document of counseling, which was issued 13 times, and the most serious finding was termination. Two officers were terminated by SPD in 2023. Referrals are something that we, we do um, when we receive uh, complaints of things that do not actually rise to the level of a complaint or they're not for the Spokane Police Department. So we, we make referrals on items such as uh, a community member wants more traffic enforcement in their neighborhood. So we call them like customer service opportunities. We'll send a, in, an internal complaint over to S, or an internal referral to SPD for that. 
for external referrals, those are things that just do not uh, fall uh, with the Spokane Police Department. So most of our external referrals were made to the Spokane County Sheriff's Office as well as code enforcement. In 2023, we had two critical incidents for the year, which is below average for Spokane. In the previous four years, we've seen an average of three uh, shootings per year. Uh, due to the timing of this brief, I must say we had five shootings before April so far in 2024. All other metrics though, as you can see on here, pursuits, preventable collisions, non-deadly uses of force, and officers' response to calls for service are all uh, ticking up a little bit. Uh, the specific numbers are annotated inside of the, that annual report if, if you want that, that information. So key principles of oversight, and I promise I'm getting towards the end. I know I'm killing you with numbers. Uh, well, harming you, sorry. Yeah. Totally bad terminology, I apologize. Uh, but in, in most of our annual reports, you're gonna see these four things emphasized in my letter. Over the last several years, I've mentioned uh, the basic principles for effective oversight. And it's independence, clearly defined and adequate jurisdiction and authority, adequate funding and operational resources, as well as public reporting and authority. So independence, just real briefly, I know I've hit you with it before, is one of the most important and defining concepts of civilian oversight. In the broadest sense, it means an absence of real or perceived influence. To maintain legitimacy, an oversight agency must be able to demonstrate its independence from law enforcement, as well as city officials, especially in the face of high profile issues. When an agency does not have clearly defined adequate, clearly defined and adequate jurisdiction and authority to perform its mission, it simply cannot be effective. Stakeholders must ensure the level of authority of an oversight agency that an oversight agency has in relation to its core oversight functions permits the agency to actually fulfill those functions. Probably the topic that would come to mind immediately when I think of those things is our ability to conduct independent investigations. Access to officers and access to information is still limited by our contract. Allocating adequate funding and operational resources are necessary to ensure that work is being performed in a thorough, timely manner and at a high level of competency. Political stakeholders must ensure support for civilian oversight includes a sustained commitment to provide adequate and necessary resources. You have done that for us um, across the years and, and I just wanna acknowledge city council's role and your advocacy for our office. Uh, the fourth one, issuing public reports is critical to an agency's credibility because it's an effective tool in bringing transparency to a historically opaque process. Reports provide a unique opportunity for the public to learn about misconduct complaints and other areas of the law enforcement agency that serves the community. So looking forward, and this is the end for me, I just wanna highlight the issues we'll be facing as we look into the end of this year as well as moving forward into the next, because I know we're, we're deep into 2024. So the first is guild contract issues. I'm sure you've heard from me at one point or another that the latest police guild contract process was extremely frustrating for our office. There were steps forward in the process because I was invited to several meetings to lay out the issues I had, as well as given the opportunity to provide proposed solutions. However, any progress was neutralized when all the language that I had proposed was removed before the, the contract was sent to you for a vote. The current terms in the contract set back civilian oversight in Spokane. When it comes to independent investigations, the OPO still doesn't have full investigative authority and access to records and officers. If we were to conduct an independent investigation right now, we would have to request interviews as well as request access to information that exists in government systems. The current contract also removed me from playing any role in the selection of the deputy police ombuds, which is completely opposite of the of the assurance 
given to me by the previous administration who told me if the police guild doesn't accept it, we won't move forward with the contract. Further, the last administration continued to erode the independence of our office by adding language that created pathways to terminate the ombuds. The SMC, the Spokane Municipal Code, clearly sets forth the OPOC, the Office of Police Ombuds Commission, as the final disciplinary authority for the office. But that acknowledgement was specifically left out of the collective bargaining agreement. Finally, we need to work on the restrictions placed on the OPO reports moving forward. We are prohibited from disclosing on significant portions of information in our reports as well as from providing our opinions. As an example, this week, regarding the limitations of our reporting, our report was used by local media in regards to a story about an officer who was fired for placing a political sticker on their patrol car. The story was picked up by other reporting agencies and the misstatements continued to intensify. A news outlet in the Seattle area even took the stance that the officer should not have been fired. It was low level misconduct and this is the danger of having biased oversight agencies who write reports and overemphasize issues. As a quick reminder, the OPO writes closing reports to make recommendations for improvement to the police department. We do not issue recommendations on discipline. Further, in this case, this was not an OPO generated complaint. This was generated by the police department. This complaint was filed and initiated by internal affairs. We did certify the investigation. That is what we do in every single case. After that, we're removed from the process. After we certify it, the case went to an ARP, an administrative review panel, and then the police chief decided to terminate the officer. I can mention this now because it has been released to the public. I'm not allowed to mention any of that in the closing reports. However, the officer was not terminated for the sticker placed on the patrol car. The officer was terminated for false and misleading statements made during the investigation, which is completely different than what has been released by our local and now state media sources. It shows a danger of not being able to be transparent in reporting. So moving forward, it's imperative we address these issues to uphold the integrity of civilian oversight and also safeguard against the efforts to erode the independence of our office. So budget independence, uh, budgetary constraints have posed additional challenges to the OPO. I acknowledge the entire city is navigating a budget deficit and every department's impacted. So over the years, we've sent forth numerous budget requests uh, regarding our budget. We have begun, though, on focusing the process of the independence of the OPO budget in the future by bringing up for consideration the idea of tying our police department or tying our budget to the a percentage point of the police department's budget. So you'll hear more about that moving forward. There are numerous oversight entities around the country that are using that as a model. It safeguards against political entities kind of removing things. Uh, from their budgets. We saw it first in Albuquerque, and then um, when we were conducting a peer review of the Office of the Independent Police Monitor in New Orleans, uh, they also utilized that function. Their budgets just provide it as a percentage. They don't take away from the agency that they're overseeing, they're just kind of tied to it as a point of reference. If the agency grows, they have a chance to grow as well. And then the last thing I'll just mention is uh, at the top of my presentation, I mentioned that your funding has helped us overcome uh, our office safety and privacy concerns when you issued us ARPA funds. We've been working on this for several years, but I need to provide you an update because progress on this initi initiative has completely stopped as a new study is being conducted, uh, which has been contracted by the facilities department for space utilization um, within City Hall. While we greatly appreciate City Council's advocacy for us, especially after all this time has passed, 
I am not certain or even hopeful that the OPO will be able to have the ARPA funds obligated prior to the end of the year as required due to this new development and the significant delays and the uncertainty that has been added to this project. So as much as I like to end my presentations asking you for money, I think I need to say I think the council needs to find another place to spend that money because I don't believe we're going to be able to with this new constraint placed on our office. And I don't want our city to lose that money. So subject to your questions, I will be followed by Commissioner Luke Jasmine. Councilman yes. Cathcart and then Councilman Bingo. Yeah. Um, well, for, first off, I want to thank you very much for the presentation and your leadership in the department and all the work and effort that you put in. I think it's really important. Um, I think it's been 11 years now since this was approved by the voters. And in my district, 70% said this is what they wanted citywide, 68%. I doubt those numbers have changed too drastically in that time. But you're right, there's still a long ways to go to full implementation of what I think most of the voters expected at that time and, and anticipated. And so I, just to reaffirm, I mean, I fully support much of what you said and absolutely work you know, with you to, to see how we can better advocate for those things. We've talked about the budget idea, which I think is a really interesting one. Um, and so, and, and thank you for reminding us on that because I would love to get some numbers, you know, worked up to see what that would look like. And so if you could just email, you know, that proposal over to, to myself, we can get it to the budget director and take a look at that from the council side. So I'd really appreciate that. But I just want to thank you again. I think this is really good, really important uh, work. And, you know, we just want to make sure that we are continuing down the right path. Thank you, sir. Councilmember Bingle, and then I'm going to Council Member Dingle, Dingle, Dylan. <laughs> about to say, how did you know my nickname growing up? Oh, my gosh. I'll get to you, Council Member Dylan, after Council Member Bingle. Yeah, Bart, thank you again for coming down here. I think it's important to note that you can both be pro-police and pro-ombudsman's office. Um, uh, police obviously are a very unique department, uh, not only within the city, but within the country. I don't know other departments that can, uh, you know, take you against your will at gunpoint. And so um, while I think our police force is very good and they do a great job, it's important that we do have civilian oversight of that office because it's a, um, it's a very unique position within the city. So thank you for what you're doing. Um, I like the idea of tying the funding level to something. I'm not sure what, um, but I like that idea and I'm interested in that conversation. Um, I also liked, um, I just lost my train of thought there, but uh, uh, no, I appreciate what, what you guys are doing. And um, oh, on the funding for the wall. Oh. I feel like we've been talking about this forever. We've been trying to fund this thing. So can we, can we also talk about that? Because I, I don't know that we're going to find, again, money like that coming up with the budget deficits we have. And I don't want us to miss out on this ARPA opportunity. So let's the arpa opportunity. Don't worry about it. Um, I have three kids under four. This is the life I live, OK? Uh, but no, but let's seriously talk about that, not to take away from a serious discussion, because you know people coming in making um, serious complaints uh, should feel comfortable knowing that they have complete uh, privacy to make that. Uh, so I want to make sure that we get that done before we lose out on that. Amen. Councilmember Dillon. Uh, I think you mean Councilmember Dingle. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Councilmember Bingle, for um, helping cover on the dad joke front. Um, and I guess, yeah, I am, you know, kind of happy to be calling in here because I, I feel like my hair is on fire right now about this ARPA discussion. This had been, a, you know, ongoing conversation. Um, you know, we did <laughs> allocate this in June, uh, in my mind, giving adequate time for this. And this was supposed to be a, a collaborative effort with facilities, as I recall. Yes, that study was moving forward, um, but there was going to be kind of this workaround or at least, um, you know, letting you kind of lead what the vision was for that, that part of that first floor um, and making it uh, more open and, and inviting while at the same time maintaining confidentiality for people who um, are coming to you and, and, and want to share. So 
Um, I'm definitely frustrated um, and just want to know what we can do to better advocate and, and get this moving. And, and I'm committed to that. Um, and again, just really appreciate all your efforts. And I know we've uh, discussed more on the kind of long-term funding piece and uh, confident that we will, we will get there. Um, but yeah, I would love to follow up on the, the ARPA uh, Tunity. Absolutely. Councilmember Klitsky. As you probably already know, I'm very supportive of your requests going forward for improving the Ombudsman office. Um, we may be obsessing a little bit too much about this ARPA money, but um, have, when I worked in a co working space, we had these pods you could go into for a quiet meeting. Would that possibly meet your needs if they were within the cost? Because those can be put anywhere and moved. I think anything is possible. Okay. Um, I'm trying I, to find I, out how much they cost from the one of the people that owned the co-working space. So we'll see. Yeah. I, I think the key the, the key with our area down there is that not only do we have a space where someone can come and deliver a complaint to us without entering our office space. Um, the acoustics on that first floor, they're almost yep. Romanesque, yes. right? Yes. I mean, you can hear conversations behind billing all the way across the first floor. So if I can hear them, I'm certain they can hear me um, and anyone delivering their, their concerns to us. So it's, there, there, there is, I don't know if that would, would fit what you're, you're, you're discussing. I'm sure there's alternatives. There's soundproof. Um, there's there's meeting size ones for like five or six people, and then there's ones that fit two to four people. At least there were at my co-working space. It's like you're working at Google, you know, and you get in one of those little eggs. Yeah. Yeah. For for someone walking up to the to the counter, I don't know what that would look like, but I'm sure someone has thought of it. Um, so, so it's a possibility. We do have our first meeting. We're we're being contacted for the first time on Thursday. So that is forward progress. Great. Right. Right. Any other questions or comments for Bart? Council Member Kekhart. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm trying to think what our next uh, committee is. I think it might be pies, but uh, maybe we can see if we can't put something on that agenda or, or a near, near term committee and have the administration come and just chat with where they're at. Great. Thank you. Was well, Commissioner Jasmine going to join you up here? All right. How are we doing? Great. Is that you up there? I'm just yeah, kidding. that is me. <laughs> you know, I was trying different hairstyles. I don't know. I sure can't see that right now. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, uh, Council President and members of the Council for allowing me to be here. My name is Luke Jasmine. I serve as the OPOC Chair, and I'm a proud resident of Chief Gary. Woo -woo. Woo -woo. And, uh, and I'm going to be giving... Um, just like Mr. Logue did, a uh, recap of 2023. I know that seems a very long time ago. Uh, during that time, uh, we had one of the council members as part of the uh, OPOC until uh, you took her away from us. Mm -hmm. um, we had a different mayor. We had a different council president. So I acknowledge that a lot of things have changed. Um, but we, we do still have uh, council member uh, Bingo and Capcart representing District 1 and really appreciate uh, you voting to get me to serve on this uh, uh, committee. It's been uh, a, an awesome process just to be a part of the OPOC. Uh, looking at our actions in uh, 2023, so we approved 13 OPO recommendations uh, in closing reports. Uh, we hosted a, a, a police reform panel. So as you can see up there, we had then President uh, Beggs and Pastor Kendricks, um, Sheriff Knowles, and former Chief Beidel, uh there to have a conversation. And, um, and, you know, the OPO got out. They got out in the community. Um, they did uh, trainings. And, uh, and it's, it's been... It's been really encouraging uh, to see how much 
uh, Lou V. May and Mr. Log are getting out in the community talking to folks. Um, and you could definitely see that they have a lot of trust in, in the community. Now, going into uh, SPD responses, so I, I did talk a little bit uh, about the uh, recommendations. So eight of them were implemented. One was partially implemented and uh, four uh, did not get implemented. Okay, so let's go to the next slide here. Starting on the, the bright side, uh, we could talk about what was implemented. So uh, as, as mentioned before, 18 out of uh, 13, uh, eight of 13 were implemented. And uh, okay, go to the next slide there. Uh, and ooh, on, do you have this one? Okay, um, so one of them is procedures when an undocumented use of force is discovered, uh, strengthening the administrative review panel analysis uh, was implemented. The administrative review um, uh, really addressing clearly the, the policies and, uh, and another piece that was implemented was providing feedback to supervisors with diver the departmental guidance. Now, going to the partially implemented, uh, so not implemented was a tracking system that accounts for all uses of force due to limited technology. And uh, use of force came up quite a bit uh, last year, the year before that, the year before that. Um, uh, it was implemented up, up, updating the terminology uh, in its manual for non-reportable force. Uh, but that is an area that we need to continue to, to work on. And then, as I mentioned, four out of 13 recommendations um, were not implemented. And a majority of this dealt with the internal affairs uh, process. So things going to internal affairs, whether it's new allegations of misconduct, administrative review, um, and really looking at the update of, of use of force policy language. Uh, and uh, just ensuring proper determinations that limit findings. Uh, so these are areas that we really need uh, support in and making sure uh, that in this year, 2024, that we can see them uh, implemented. So if I could talk about the uh, OPO for a little bit. Uh, I have had the... Uh, privilege to be able to go uh, to some of the trainings like the NACO training and uh, we have police departments we have um, different oversight uh, groups and and uh, so many different folks um, at those and it's really cool to come from little old Spokane uh, and see the amount of respect that Louvi May and Mr. Logue um, receive and that uh, Mr. Logue is in leadership positions. That is huge. Uh, and it shows uh, what type of work that they're doing. And I love the fact that they are able to uh, stay level. Uh, there's a lot of pressures, right? Uh, I'm sure you know about pressures uh, every single day. And it takes a certain character to make sure uh, that they're sticking with the facts, uh, that they're sticking with the process. Uh, and ensuring that they're doing the best that they can for the community. So, um, so uh, huge evaluation for, uh, 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 huge uh, kudos, I should say, uh, to the OPO office and, and the work that they're doing in regards to community engagement, reporting, and civilian oversight. Okay, now what everybody's been waiting for, the challenges. So. Uh, Mr. Logue talked about this before. Uh, our biggest challenge is, despite the wall, mm -hmm. right? You know, we're always talking about building the wall. Um, <laughs> so, uh, despite the wall, yeah, I'm a dad too, so I got so <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, looking at the police guild contract, really, it, it just it diminishes uh, the OPO's ability uh, to do its work, whether it's investigation or what they're able to report. Uh, and, um, and I mean, just the simple fact of uh, Mr. Logue not being able to select uh, the 
deputy ombuds. I mean, that should be a, a no-brainer. And, uh, and I'm hoping that this city council, we've seen you be very supportive of the Office of Police Ombuds. Uh, we really need to see these things in place because as you mentioned, uh, Council Member Catcart, this is what the people voted for. They voted for transparency. They voted for independence. And let's make sure that we're pushing and we're making sure that happens. So uh, subject to your questions and hopefully half the time, uh, that, that was my report. Councilman Bingo. Yeah, I guess this is the first time I've heard that you weren't able to select your deputy. Uh, can you share a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, I was specifically removed from the process. So not only, um, I don't have a say at all. Uh, there's. So who selects, I guess, then? So it will go to uh, the administration and council will convene a selection panel similar to if you were to select a new um, ombuds and a member of the guild, a member of the lieutenants and captains association, uh, someone from council, someone from uh, uh, the administration side and then somebody else. Uh, they did say that I could watch the process. So, so yeah, so then it goes from there to the OPOC who makes a final determination. Um, and they have to choose one of the three people provided to them by the panel. So if we go back to the word independent, I have to show that I'm independent from those sort of uh, law enforcement, political entities, which all will have, depending on the flavor of the day, right? Everybody changes positions. Um, we need to still be able to move forward um, no matter who's in the chair. So we're looking for... Uh, well, really, the same process that any other department head would be allowed to have in a city in, in uh, choosing their deputy. He's, I am particularly um, concerned that right now we have, I have some law enforcement background, but Louie May, she does not. And she comes from a legal background. So she has an entirely different approach than I do when it comes to looking at cases. And because of that, we have twice the robust conversations that we would if we both kind of said, oh, yeah, I understand why they do that the way it is. So we're really able to dig deeper because we're not, we don't come from, from, from the same perspectives. So there's a lot more on that, but it specifically removed me from it during this last bargaining. Councilman McCackard. Yeah, and, and Louie does a great job, by the way. Uh, the... I seem to recall this conversation coming up during the, the uh, uh, negotiations in two, 2020, and I, I thought that it was going to it was addressed there. Am I am I incorrect that that was not? Because I seem to recall something where the guild had almost like a veto over who you would uh, potentially hire. Is that am I remembering that correctly or? Yeah, I have not seen that. Okay, so I, I remember some of these from the from 2020, but I thought they got resolved then, and so. Yes. So they did not. Uh, and so it wasn't like we took a step backwards in this contract. It was simply that we still did not get certain things resolved. Is that correct? And correct me if I'm wrong, please. So not having that specifically in front of me, I would still say that when we're going towards um, becoming independent from the powers to be. So we played a little game with us last year. They invite us into uh, the negotiating room, hundreds, maybe not hundreds, a lot of hours, mm -hmm. um, a lot of briefs, a lot of things written down where we specifically had kind of agreed on language. Then Mr. Perkins at the time, the city administrator said, these are the things which would help us on independent investigations, uh, uh, fix the, uh, the deputy issue, Reporting issue, there was never really an appetite to move forward on, on the reporting issue, so that was still going to be, but you don't always get to, to get the whole apple pie, right? Sometimes you'll get a few apples and, and, and you just move forward. But he was adamant that this was going to be what happened. So we even had, right before the end of it, um, before the end, we had an extra meeting to just confirm that the, everyone in that, uh, so the city administration was there, um, 
Mr. Piccolo was there. Uh, obviously, Mr. Henry was there, uh, the lawyer for the guild, or not the guild, the uh, the, the city. Uh, the police guild was in the room. Uh, management was in the room, and we all, no, I, I don't think the police guild was there. But regardless, we agreed on the principles going forward. Not a single one of those principles made it. So when I want to define whether or not it's a step backwards or not, that's probably just a personal opinion. Uh, well, if I we're just... probably not worse off because we're still able to write reports, Yeah. right? So we are still able to do some things, but it does lead to some misinterpretation one, one last follow-up. Obviously, we don't control the negotiating process. We don't even have a, an official role in it. We have a staff person who's able to sit in a lot of those conversations, uh, which is frustrating because I would like to have a better understanding of what is being discussed. Uh, but I'm just wondering, has the, because I think the administration can include you, has there been any conversation around either in the next iteration of that contract or Potentially, if there's sort of a reopening of negotiation sooner than that, has there been any discussion about having you uh, just included in a little bit more than you have been in the past in those discussions? Very, very minor. Okay. Um, but that's likely because we just, it's a new administration and they're r figuring out how to run the city in their first year. Sure. Uh, so it has come up. We've, I've also had conversations with Dave Duncan about trying to come up with a memorandum of understanding in regards to some of these issues. I mentioned that to Mayor um, Brown just even last week. So we'll see if we can't move some of that alongside there. But uh, all we can do is this is our only chance to address any of these longstanding issues, whether you control it or not. This is our, our, our public forum to, to let you know where, where we're at. Um, the ceiling's not falling, but we still have room to grow. Councilmember Navarrete. You want to go first then, Councilmember Navarrete. Okay. Council President, I see your face, and I know you're like the, you got to stay on time. Um, what, what I will say, and, and obviously want to hear your question, is um, is, the, is the council open to, uh, if we were able to draft something and, and look for support uh, from you, uh, is that something you'd be open to looking at and possibly Make, do an action on. Councilmember. I, I guess I would just want to make sure from legal that we're not crossing any lines. Uh, there are some very blurred and hard to understand lines when it comes to labor law, and so would, would definitely look to them. But assuming I agreed with what was in there, I'd be open to it. Ditto. Councilmember Navarrete. Thank you. Um, so that's exactly what I was going to ask. Uh, when does your, remind me when your contract ends? Okay, hopefully I'll still be here. But um, <laughs> you do have the, um, the opportunity to change, um, to make the OPO what it's supposed to be, um, a, a strict oversight. Because I, I remember very frustrating um, not being accessible to uh, footage or talking to officers uh, on reports. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we should, you know, if the majority of us are still here, hopefully we can support you and, and make that OPO. Again, um, a true uh, civilian oversight office. Um, one thing I also want to um, mention is, uh, I, I, just going back to your um, report, uh, Mr. Logue, the I did read the article on the, the sticker. Um, I do you want to urge um, our news outlets to get the stories correct? Um, I know you'll have your deadlines, but misinformation that gets out there, um, anybody picks it up and just creates this whole, you know, wave of misinformation. Um, so just, uh, you know, I think they all have uh, their our information to, to get the story 100% accurate um, before putting it out there. Well, thank you, um, Ombuds, uh, Mr. Logan, Luke, for coming. I believe if you brought something to council, we would always take it under consideration uh, how to best support what the people voted for. So thank you. Thank you. Before we get going, I'd just like to acknowledge 
In the back, there's a row of young people. They are from the School of Nursing at WSU. Just wave your hand. I told them I'd embarrass them. Go ahead. Put your hands up. They didn't want to speak. And then my last embarrassment is Nate Sanford. This is his last meeting with us. I hear he'll be relocating or going some. Where are you going, Nate? Seattle. Going to Seattle. There you go. Uh, we do wish you well. And uh, you got that little dig from Councilmember Navarati on your way out the door. Get the reporting right. So uh, thank you for covering us all this time. And to the nursing students, I told them to come back and sign up and testify. So maybe they'll do that next time you're here. But welcome and thanks for joining us this evening. All right, we're going to go into our legislative session on open for on um, the advanced the agenda tonight, our consent agenda. We have several uh, public comments. We are going to take on the consent agenda item number 12, 11, 12, 14, 15, 16 separately. But this time I'll be calling on Thomas Gallagher, Will Hewlings, and this is on the consent agenda tonight. Thomas? Is he online? Thomas, if you're online, can you press star three or raise your hand? No, Thomas, we'll have Will, and then after Will, we'll have Raul, and then Terry Hill. Welcome, Will. Uh, good uh, good uh, evening. Uh, my name is Will Hewlings, and I live downtown Spokane. Um, I want to show support of OPR 2023 0017, which extends the Salvation Army's operation of the track shelter through October 31st, 2024. Um, it's a necessary step to ensure vital services continue for those in need. Um, I'm deeply concerned by the notion of shutting down track shelter as proposed by the new Mayor Lisa Brown. Transitioning to neighborhood shelters sounds like a recipe for disaster. It's impractical and lacks the comprehensive support that a centralized shelter like TRAC provides. Honestly, it sounds like something out of left field, reminiscent of Julie Garcia's far-fetched ideas with jewel stealing hands. The Salvation Army has been doing commendable work under challenging circumstances. Um, they make the best of what they have. Um, something that I find quite disturbing, I just learned from somebody that actually stays at the Trent shelter is, there's a lot of drug overdoses. For a city run shelter, <laughs> run by the city, and we're given the Salvation Army, I'm just, it baffles me why there's so many people overdosing in the bathrooms at the Trent shelter. Um, I mean, so hopefully these little neighborhood shelters that Lisa Brown's putting in all these neighborhoods, they don't have the same problems. They don't attract all the drug addicts and all the other people that a lot of these places attract. But thank you. Thank you, Will. Raul? My name is Rule Pena, District 1. Yeah, the agenda to extend. Uh, you already spent $16 million plus on people that don't give a rat's tutu about the rules and regulations. They try to do their dope. They try to go over there, eat free, get sheltered for the night, and go back out and rip off stores. And on top of that, what happened to the one point plus million dollars that they were supposed to use that's in an account for the bathrooms that the city can't put in. Where's that money going to? I think that, you know, in the past two years, $16 million could have been spent more on traffic calming, arresting people that do drugs, putting them in jail because they're doing their drugs, they're stealing, they're robbing people. So, you know, 
It's a revolving door. You're going to spank the boy because he ate the donut, yet you put a whole dozen donuts on the table where he can reach them? This is what the city is doing. You're promoting because you're making money for people who use dope and abuse the system. Then we come down here and complain to each and every one of you about a broken system that receives money to continue the broken wheel, the broken car. You all putting everything into District 1. Why not put some of these uh, facilities that you all want, like you, Klisky, up on us North Hill, up on, you know, where, <clears throat> instead of down here to the poor people. We pay taxes, but yet our taxes are all spent across the way. Think about it. And you come to my neighborhood. You haven't been there in 30 years. Come to my neighborhood and see what it's really about now. Thank you. Terry Hill? Pass. You pass. Uh, Christopher Benjamin? Yeah, I'm a tenant at the um, current shelter, and at least for, for the moment. Um, I have some pretty big public safety concerns. For example, there are some very elderly people there that can barely move around. And if they end up getting out on the streets, uh, chances are they won't survive even one night. Um, Many of them have no place to go, no income, and no place to go. And, and these are very elderly people. I, for one, have a, a small income. But um, I don't, the, um, the elderly people are of very much concern. And then the other concern is, is that it's a public safety issue. This is the only low bar, it is the only low bar shelter in town. The only one that accepts sex offenders. Now, I agree that nobody wants sex offenders around. Nobody wants them around. It just is what it is. But the, the, the fact that they're there gives them a small amount of supervision. And a small amount. And if they happen to reoffend, they're easy to find. If you put them out on the street, all of that goes away. They'll be much harder to find, much harder to prosecute, and much harder, and um, they will have zero supervision. There are some drug overdoses there, but um, I believe that security could step up their game a little bit and handle that. I just don't. Have, I, have, I don't have the authority to make them do that, but I do have a position where I can talk to people in authority that can make them do that. So I just think that if you close that shelter, you're going to create a big public safety risk. Um, plus all the all the, those drug offenders also will have no place to go. Now I do think that if we had a... Uh, a um, rehabilitation center open that these drug offenders, when they do offend, can be transferred to the to the um, rehabilitation center and maybe get some some kind of treatment, which would help to um, alleviate some of that pressure, and then there would have there would be some kind of repercussions for what they do. And then we have some some accountability. So I, but I believe that if you're going to close that shelter, some of these uh, scatter shelters that you talk about need to be open first. Thank you, Benjamin. Your time is up. Justin Holler, and then Dave, and then Sherry Barnett. Last week, um, well, 
Which one was this about? Consent agenda. Consent. Oh, this is consent agenda. Okay, well, um, so it's kind of, kind of broad, but um, yeah, my name is Justin, uh, District One. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's astounding that you guys don't look at uh, line by line with the budget, and I really wish you would, and cut out the fat. Um, there's so many programs that are, are um, over over uh, that they're they're bloated, and yeah, this this I'm not speaking of any one thing, but you know the, the consent agenda includes many things, and it's just frustrating to see that you can spend copious amounts of money on the homeless problem without actually ever solving it, and there's no metric, there's no goalpost, there's no um, light at the end of the tunnel, there's no, there's no gold at the end of the rainbow on this one. And if you could um, you know, offer uh, jail rehab or a ticket out of town, that would maybe incentivize people to get their act together instead of giving them Narcan 50 times because that, that's costing the taxpayers copious amounts of money, especially when you have to have a truck and an ambulance because people are stealing ambulances. And it's just, it's just horrible to see that the, the waste of resources. And it's really frustrating. And I, I know a lot of people on my Friday coffee group that feel as well, but they don't have time to come here. So I kind of speak for them in, in, in some regard. And there, there's a bunch of us that are, are fed up with the waste of money and it just, you know, I wish you guys could stand up to King Inslee's uh, um, rules, edicts, whatever you want to call them, you know, the, the green agenda. If Spokane Valley can stand up to him, why can't you guys? You know, why spend $200,000 on electric cars when you clearly can't afford it when you're over budget? You know, hybrids will work just fine for the foreseeable future, five to ten years until uh, um, the, the sodium uh, batteries come out. Uh, there's just so many things that... that you could just look line by line and, 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 and do it by the house metric. Would I do this? Would I spend this for my house? Because if you're not all on electric cars, we shouldn't be either. Thank you. Dave and then Sherry Barnett. Good evening, Council President, Council, Dave Bills and Logan. I want to speak to the track shelter. While it's not the greatest place in the world for those 200, 250 people, but I'm a little concerned that if you continue month to month paying for it, those people are worried that the rug is going to be pulled out from underneath them in November or December. It's a serious concern to be thrown out of a shelter in November or December, January, February, that's a death sentence. Literally a death sentence. So we need to make sure that thing stays open at least till April. In the meantime, we need to work on alternatives to the track shelter. We need those alternatives in place before we close the track shelter because people need a place to go. I have asked that so many times, where do these people go, and gotten no answer. Well, let's get an answer going where these people can go. They need some place, but they need some place with showers and bathrooms. Can you imagine going out to the bathroom in December and it's a porta potty? That's why we want them out of there. But that is preferred to having to get up and walk out in the snow and find some place to do your business. Trust me, I've done 10 cities in the snow. It's no fun. It's a hard way to live. So please, keep this thing going. It's so important to those 250 people. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Sherry? City Council President and all members of the City Council. Well, I've kind of said this opinion before, but um, the Salvation Army, as I saw it, they stepped up when things were in dire disaster. And this council has, I think, uh, a propensity to kind of disapprove the religious groups. The Salvation Army has done, 
I, I don't know how much here, but I, every place that I've ever seen them, they've done good. And we have to do something. I mean, I believe that God gives power to get past drugs. We have people that are just draining us dry, and this will grow. If we don't stop the drugs, we will be more and more immersed with poverty and expenses, hospital expenses, homeless expenses, brain. They will be going on, on Social Security because they will lose their brain power. I've seen it since I've been here increasing, and it's intensifying even around me. So I urge you to hold on to the Salvation Army. And uh, I know that the UGM does great work. They don't ask for money, but they, they deserve respect. And all these people, are they're young. They're, they're foolishly tied into it. It's getting into the schools. It's into the friendship groups. We need to totally clamp down on drugs if we want to have a good community. Thank you much. Thank you, Sherry. Again, let me repeat, on the consent agenda, we'll be taking number 11, 12, 14, 15, and 16 separately. So right now, I'll entertain a motion to approve the others, not as I have identified. So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and second to approve the other items that were not identified. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any aye. no's? Extensions? All right. Thank you all for that. Let's start with number 11, and that is the contract extension with the Salvation Army. Any other discussion around number 11? Move to approve. Yeah, we're good. Move to approve. Number 11. Motion. No, no, I don't just, think just, we do. Okay. We just, we just yeah. moved to approve. So all yeah. those in favor of number 11, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any no's? Aye. Abstentions? Number 11 passes. It's at 7 0. Th that was no. yet. Two. Who was that? 5 2. two. Okay, thank you. Now we're taking number 12, and that is the contract amendment with volunteers. I think you can take all of those as a group. If you want. Well, do you want to take them as a group, Bingo, or did you want to discuss them each one by one? No, I'm, I'm happy to take them all. I didn't Are you know happy if... with the group? Yeah. yeah. I wasn't uh, sure. It wasn't if, indicated. Can we just do 16 separate? Yeah. But you can do the next three. Okay, so we're going to, at this point in time, we're going to take 12, 14, and 15 as a group. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any aye. no's? No. no. Abstentions? Those passes. Now, number 16. That is the acceptance of the fiscal year emergency solutions grant. Am I correct? Is that the one? Discussion on that one? All those in favor of number 16, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any no's? No. Abstentions? That passes. Thank you. Ms. Fister, on to special budget orders. Ordinances amending ordinance number C36467 passed by the City Council November 27, 2023 and entitled an ordinance adopting the annual budget of the City of Spokane for 2024, making appropriations to the various funds of the City of Spokane government for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2024, and providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage and declared an emergency and appropriating funds in Ordinance C36572, Housing Local Sales Tax Fund. Number one, increase appropriation by $12,059,000. A of the increased appropriation, $11,800,000 is provided solely for contractual services. B of the increased appropriation, $259,000 is provided solely for the city's administrative costs, including salaries, benefits, supplies, and equipment. This action arises from the recent request for proposals to, to spend housing sales tax funding. 
We have one public comment. Justin Holler. Yeah, my name is Justin Haller, District One. Um, again, what do you, what do you, what's, what's the plan with the tax money? You know, is, is it written down anywhere? Is, is there any kind of plan for the tax dollars, or is it just, oh, well, yeah, we'll just we'll just appropriate funds for here or for there? Is it just all willy nilly, or is there actually a, 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 any accountability and you know something where tangible and real, or is it just esoteric? Thank you. Any council commentary? All those in favor, prepare to vote. I was going to go. What about those not in favor? Yeah, Can yeah. we still vote? All those. <laughs> All right, prepare to vote. <laughs> Councilmember Dillon said yes. Did I get everybody? Oh, did he say yes? Oh. Our hand up. And Councilmember Dillon said yes. Oh. Councilmember Dillon, can you give a an oral vote? Yes, I uh, the the hands up emoji. Thought that might work, but happy to do oral votes. <laughs> it, looked, well. it looked like a raised hand and a, a thumb or up. A no. An <laughs> I or a no. Thank, thank you, Council Member. Aye. 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 Great. That's right. Ordinance C-36573, general fund. Number one, add one exempt city prosecutor to the legal department from one to two. Two, increase revenue by $32,200. A of the increased revenue, $32,200, is provided solely for an operating transfer in from the Cannabis Tax Fund. Three, increased appropriation by $32,200. A of the increased appropriation, $32,200, is provided solely for base wages and employee benefits. This action arises from adding an additional prosecutor position in the legal department to focus on serious narcotics prosecutions. We have two public comments, Terry Hill and then Christine Quinn. And Christine, if you're online, you can hit star three. Terry Hill, Spokane. I urge a yes vote on adding a uh, city prosecutor to uh, the legal department. Uh, the language here to focus on serious narcotic prosecutions. I hope that means going after drug dealers. The more of these dirt bags you can get off the street, the better off we are. Thank you. Christine, if you're online, can you hit star three or raise your hand? No, Christine. No, Christine. Any council commentary? <clears throat> Councilman Bingo? You know, Terry, we don't, we don't agree often, but when we do, I want to shout it out. Uh, I think Terry said it really well. The more of these dirt bags we can get off the streets, the better. Could not agree more with that statement. Um, I think this is a very good action from the Brown administration. I want to thank the mayor and her team for working out um, this partnership with the U.S. Attorney's Office. I want to thank uh, the attorney, uh, Ms. Waldruff. Again, um, what I'm hoping this does, there's, there's no single greater issue facing the city of Spokane right now than, than drugs and uh, drug usage. Um, and if we can go upstream uh, and get the serious offenders, the serious dealers um, in the area, I, 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 I would be very excited, and I think this partnership has some real promise. Um, I'm hoping that we get to see some real metrics that come in and show how we're getting drugs off the street. Um, and so, again, to Mayor Brown and her administration, thank you for this step. Thank you for your uh, actions and uh, your partnership with the U.S. Attorney's Office. Any other council commentary? I just want to say I saw a special just last night on PBS about drugs and fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And... It's not just Spokane. Let's just remind ourselves it's ravaging everywhere. But we do need that additional enforcement in DEA and the federal level. So any partnership with anyone, I'm excited to support. Prepare to vote. Aye. Thank you. <clears throat> Ordinance C-36574, Public Safety and excuse me, judicial grants funds. Number one, increased revenue by $215,000. A of the increased revenue, $215,000, is provided by Washington Traffic Safety Commission through the Outreach and Training Program. Number two, increased appropriation by $215,000. A of the increased appropriation, $185,000. 
is to be provided solely for base wages and employee benefits. B, of the increased appropriation, $10,000 is to be provided solely for minor equipment. C, of the increased appropriation, $10,000 is to be provided solely for registration schooling. D, of the increased appropriation, $10,000 is to be provided solely for contractual services. This action arises from the need to accept grant funding from Washington Traffic Safety Commission for GUI outreach and training. There is no public comment. Any council commentary? Seeing none, prepare to vote. Thank you. Council Member Aye. Dillon. Oh. Thank you. Resolution 2024-86, setting the assessment roll hearing before City Council for December 2nd, 2024 for the Downtown Parking and Business Improvement Area, Business Improvement District bid, and providing notice of the 2025 assessments to business and property owners. We have one public comment. Will Hewlings? Good evening again. My name is Will Hewlings, and I live downtown Spokane, just a few blocks from here. But I have been a resident of downtown Spokane since November 2019. While I, while I am not a rate payer in the downtown parking and business improvement area, I care deeply about Spokane, and I'm here to speak in support of Resolution 20. 240086, which sets to sets the assessment roll hearing for December 2nd, 2024. The downtown bid was established in 1995 and was designed to provide vital services to the downtown district, security ambassadors, maintenance, marketing, parking, parking, and economic development. These services are supposed to keep our downtown clean, safe, and attractive for residents, businesses, and visitors alike. Unfortunately, de despite these intentions, I am not seeing the impact of these programs. As someone who lives downtown, I walk these streets daily, and what I see is disheartening and alarming. Trash, graffiti, urine, feces, aluminum foil from drug use, needles, and broken glass litter the sidewalks. Homeless, homelessness is rampant, especially near where I live. You guys probably all know by now. And open drug use has been a disturbing common sight. I can't help but ask, where are the street ambassadors? Why aren't they out? Where's the cops on foot? Spokane Police Department, why aren't they out on foot, on bikes? They need a police presence downtown. I don't know, I just see them driving around in their cars. And then I got to call crime check sometimes two to three times a day to report people doing drugs. They don't care about me or the people that live downtown. They don't care about businesses. They just care about doing their drugs. Thank you, Will. Any council commentary? And it's just to set the hearing date. Prepare to vote. Aye. Thank you. Resolution 2024-87, setting the assessment roll hearing before City Council for December 2nd, 2024, for the East Sprague Parking and Business Improvement Area, Business Improvement District bid, and providing notice of the 2025 assessments to business and property owners. There's no public comment. Any council commentary? Prepare to vote. Aye. Resolution 2024-88, appro approving grants for multicultural centers as funded by the American Rescue Plan Act. One public comment, Mr. Hewlings. Good evening again. My name is Will Hewlings, and I live downtown Spokane. Um, I stand before you as a multicultural minority, or as some might say, a person of color, to express my strong opposition to Resolution 2024-0088. Uh, this resolution allocates $900,000 of ARPA, American Rescue 
uh, well, ARPA funding to nine community organizations, all receiving $100,000 each for what are labeled as multicultural centers. I want to be clear, my opposition is not because I don't believe in multicultural representation or support for co communities of color. In fact, I believe deeply in supporting marginalized communities. However, when I look at recipients of this funding, organizations like Asians for Collective Liberation, Latinos and Spokane, the Martin Luther King Jr. Family Outreach Centers and others, I can't help but see a troubling trend. All these groups appear to be leaning heavily left, promoting ide ideologies that do not represent the full diversity or thoughts in our multicultural community. I went on there and I looked, and it's just interesting that the people that are on the boards and all the members, they use she and him and all these different terms, it seems that when it comes to funding, only one side of the political spectrum is being served. What about the rest of us? Are we not also multicultural, not also deserving of support? Spokane's multicultural community is broad and diverse, yet this funding leaves out voices that don't align with a certain political narrative. Thank you, Will. How does thank that you, serve thank you, Will. diversity? Thank you. Any council commentary? Time left, yeah. yeah, he still had time. Oh, my apologies. Yeah. All right. I'll comment. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm uh, excited to be supporting this and to see this money get out the door. I know um, council first originally uh, approved this funding, I think my first year on council, so over two years ago. And it took a long time of a lot of intentional outreach to community groups and organizations to hear back from community members about um, how a multicultural investment or investment multicultural centers would be best uh, allocated, knowing that this was a finite amount of resources. Um, there's a lot more need and a lot of great organizations doing a lot of great work. And so um, I'm excited to see these investments and see how um, lots of different organizations in our community can continue to grow and make our city a more vibrant place where everybody belongs. Great. Councilmember Navarrete. Thank you. I echo um, Councilmember Sapone's um, comments. I'm also as a person of color and uh, an immigrant um, and have been working with um, several, um, actually all of the multicultural centers that applied for this grant. Um, just a point of information that they are nonpartisan and they serve everybody in Spokane, not just uh, people of color. So I'm very happy to support this. Any other council commentary? Prepare to vote. Aye. Great. Resolution 2024-89, setting forth the city council's approval and endorsement of funding for contracts for CHHS arising from the home art program allocation and from the 1590 sales and use, uses tax revenue allocation for housing related services and authorizing the execution of the applicable and appropriate contracts once formalized without further city council action. There is no public comment. Any council commentary? Prepare to vote. Aye. Resolution 2024-90 is deferred indefinitely. Ordinance C-36-120 is deferred to October 21 agenda. First reading ordinances, Ordinance C-36-575 regarding the preservation of salvageable material, amending Section 8.02.031 of the Spokane Municipal Code, adopting a new Chapter 15.06 to Title 15 of the Spokane Municipal Code. Ordinance C-36-578 relating to the recruitment of applicants to the SHRC amending section 4.10.020 of the Spokane Municipal Code. And Ordinance C-36-579 of the City of Spokane, Washington suspending the acceptance of annual applications for amendments to the City's comprehensive plan until completion of the City's mandated periodic comprehensive plan update expected to be completed and adopted in 2026. Further action is deferred on the first reading ordinances. We have three public comments, Justin Haller, Paul Raul Pena, and Will Hewlings. I forgot my notes. Oh, 
Alex, what was this one about? It's the first reading ordinances. First. One is about regarding the preservation of salvageable material. Ordinance C-36578 is relating to the recruitment of applicants to the SHRC, and Ordinance C-36579 is suspending okay. the acceptance of annual applications for amendments to the city's comprehensive plan. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this, 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 uh, sorry. Um, Justin Aller, District 1 is still... Um, why? I don't know if this ties into it as far as recycling, but we don't have recycling every week now. We have recycling every other week. And you guys are taxing us more. How, how does that work out? And recycling is predominantly a hoax because it all goes in the same landfill. Thank you. Uh, Raul Pena? Once again, my name is Raul Pena, District Run, and I'm just here in support for uh, Ordinance 36577 that was put out because, you know, hey, every time, every time there's a vote against Mr. Cascard, Mr. Bengal, it's a five to two. It's a five to two. Every time something that is in, important to the north side of town gets outvoted five to two. I've asked uh, Lily over here to come down to my neighborhood. I invite Kliski, since she has been there in 30 years, to come down and see the issues that I have. That a $3,000 job on a sidewalk is not allowed, but everything else goes 29th Street. Uh, over $620,000 goes to the trench shelter. Uh, what happened to the $1.5 million that was supposed to be used that's in an account? For you know bathrooms, you know all that money can be reallocated to the north side for issues that my representatives and me are fighting over. We still have uh, the water department and their garbage and the dirt that they're putting in next to a school. Right. So, Ralph, thank you, but those are not the items on the first yeah, reading ordinance. Uh, I'm just you know, but the agenda is. My point is, every time my representatives bring something forward, they're always outvoted on specific issues that so, we need. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Will Hewley? All right, thank you, Will. S1, letter to Governor Inslee, Deputy Energy Secretary Turk, and EPA Regional Administrator Six Killer asking for more public comment and local engagement in relation to the shipment of nuclear waste through the city of Spokane. We have a couple of public comments. Terry Hill and then Dave. Terry Hill, Spokane. As an old war horse and uh, a steward of our planet, I've spoken at several FSEC hearings about the danger of oil trains, in hearings in uh, Vancouver, Washington, Tri-Cities, Linwood, Bellingham, and probably a few more. Those dangers posed, the dangers posed by those oil trains is pale in comparison to the dangers posed by shipments of nuclear waste through our city. It's my hope that Spokane County and other jurisdictions, and every jurisdiction on this convoluted route takes the same actions that, that you're considering tonight. I urge all of you to sign on to this letter and to call Governor Inslee and give him some stuff that I can't say. With that, I yield the podium. Thank you, Terry. Dave? Good evening again. 
we need an opportunity <clears throat> to put this subject up to more public scrutiny. If they're going to try and run the stuff through Spokane instead of Oregon, Oregon has less population down there. We have more population here at danger. And so the way that my friends and I have been dis discussing it, Oregon already said F you. Well, guess what? We got a bigger F you than they have. And I want to be able to do that. I want to stand up and say, hell no. We will not have nuclear crap coming to this town. We have over 200,000 people in Spokane alone, 400,000 in the county that would be affected by a derailment. And you can't say it doesn't happen in Spokane because it happened in 72, and we're due for another one. Let's hope it's not nuclear or oil or coal. The oil and the coal scares the hell out of me already. This nuclear thing, hey, come on, I grew up climbing under desks. Okay? Nuclear scares me. I've studied it immensely. We had a, a nuke plant come in in Grace Harbor. And I studied the heck out of that thing. And the last thing we want in Spokane is nuclear waste. You want to see more people complaining? I was part of the group that complained about the coal trains and oil trains. We're ready to do it again. Let's get these hearings going. Let's get some people looking at this. And let's wake Spokane up so we don't have to deal with this crap. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Will, are you going to comment? Good evening. My name is Will Hewlings, and I live downtown Spokane. Uh, I voice my strong opposition to CPR 2024-0016, Councilman Zappone's letter to the state officials regarding nuclear waste shipments through Spokane. While I understand concerns about nuclear waste and the need for transparency, this issue is a distraction from far more urgent matters facing our city. First, the Pone's focus on nuclear waste shipments seems misplaced. We have representatives at the federal level, like Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers, who are far better suited to deal with issues surrounding nuclear waste and its transportation through Spokane. And just so you know, I look out my window and I see the trains coming through downtown. And I'm not scared about no waste. And also, just so you know, I built a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier when I was 18. So, and I served a lot of time on a nuclear-powered ship. So I, this, this nonsense about this, but uh, this is their jurisdiction and they are equipped with the resources and expertise to ensure that these operations are conducted safely. Um, what we should be focusing on instead are the real dangers facing our city. Dangers like fentanyl. The opioid crisis and fentanyl specifically is a clear and present threat slash danger to Spokane. We see the effects daily, overdoses, addiction, and increased crime, all stemming from the influx of this deadly drug. This is very, a real crisis that is killing our residents, devastating our families, and overwhelming our emergency services. Yet I see no comparable urgency from Zappone on this issue. How is it that nuclear waste shipments would have been, which have been transported safely for decades, through Spokane, very safely, are getting more attention than the drug epidemic ravaging our city. It is also north, worth noting that the safest way to transport hazardous materials is by train, whether it's nuclear waste or anything else. Despite accidents like the tragic one in East Palestine, Ohio, rail remains statistically the safest mode of transportation for materials of this nature. Yes, accidents happen, but rail has proven itself far safer than shipping hazardous waste by trucks. I mean, is that what you want, Zapone? Anyways, that's all I got. Thank you, Will. 
Any council commentary? Councilmember Bingo? Yeah, so I was uh, supportive of this statement from the beginning, actually would have supported um, a suspension of the rules to get this statement made because um, uh, you know, it, it, there was a hearing that was coming. Um, and I, I agree that there are probably more important things in the city of Spokane, but it's not as if we can only focus on one thing. I think we should be focusing on fentanyl. And I actually think that this is a good thing to say, hey, let's not be transporting liquid nuclear waste through the city of Spokane. Um, one spill, I mean, would, would cause serious problems for generations. And so I, I appreciate most of this letter. I will say... Up until today, uh, I understood the letter to be one thing, and then we, we uh, adopted an amendment earlier today, and uh, when asked, you know, what was the substance of the change, I was told that there was no substantive change. However, it turns out there was, and this is my one problem with this, I think, overall, is that this is what it added. From, from just all this, hey, we need to do an environmental impact statement, great. Hey, maybe we can make this into a solidified form before we transport it, and then you make it into a solidified form. I think that makes a ton of sense, protecting our people from all that. Love it. And then this gets slid in there. One final note about this endeavor, city council understands that there's a reasonably cost-effective opportunity to use unionized labor within Washington state in pursuing a solidification plan, which we would also support. That, to me, I can't believe that that wasn't brought up when we asked what were the changes. Um, I don't think we need to be necessarily endorsing unionized labor on this. I think whoever can do the job and get it done before it goes through the city of Spokane, contract with them. I couldn't care less if they're unionized or not. With my criticism on that, I still think that this is a good idea for us to move this forward. Um, I think Jackson has done a great job on, on working with all this. Uh, I thank Council Members Zappone for bringing this forward. Again, one spill is all it would take in the city of Spokane to cause generational impacts. And so um, I'll be signing on to this letter, but I do want it on the record that I'm frustrated that that got slipped in there. Council Member Dillon. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I mean, to me, this is a real kind of common sense approach. Um, I really do appreciate the addition of um, the solidification uh, process, knowing that you know that is the uh, preferred and, and safe method. Um, that would reduce um, significantly the impacts if there were was ever a, a spill in Spokane. And thank you, Council Members Zappone and uh, Jackson, for for all your work on this. Councilmember Zappone? Yeah, I wanted to uh, say thank you to Commissioner Waldriff who raised the attention to us and reached out to us in her role and really flagging this for us and uh, us taking some quick action on it. And thanks, Jackson, for working on it. And Representative Paulette, who came today to speak to us uh, at a last minute request, too. Um, I, like many people, was quite alarmed when we heard that this might be happening in Spokane. And um, with learning more, I think that it is clear that we need to have some more public engagement on this, have NEPA SEPA public process instead of this happening quickly without the public knowing about it, um, and making sure that we're keeping our residents safe and making sure we're keeping everyone along our urban corridor safe um, for now and for the future too. And uh, it sounds like there are other possible alternatives and we should be exploring all possible options to make sure that we mitigate all risks for our community. Yeah, council, council member uh, Cathcart. Yeah, I'll just say I'll be uh, drafting and sending my own letter this week. Uh, I still have some, some continued uh, technical questions related to some of this. And frankly, I just think we should be a little bit more insistent that it doesn't come anywhere near our city, little, whether or not it's solidified or not. So I don't know that I would be necessarily okay, but that was some of the questions I was trying to get to today was understanding that piece. And I don't know that I'm willing to compromise on that. So. I will likely be drafting my own letter that also asks some additional questions and tries to, to get a little bit further into the weeds on this, but that's what I plan to do this week. Thank you. See if no, prepare to vote. Prepare to vote. I think that's a voice vote. Aye. Can I do a voice vote or do you want to record a recorded vote? I think it's a Mr. Voice. Wright? I'm not sure. I think it's In that case, let's do a recorded vote. Prepare to vote. Aye. Good. Thank you. Uh, your vote wasn't up there. Oh. Or at least I didn't see it up here. Let's do it one more time. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our legislative agenda this evening. We're now going into open forum.
Please remember all comments are made to the council president. You have two minutes. And our list of open forum tonight. And council president, would you mind if we started with Christine Quinn, who was able to join online and wants to testify? All right, let's start with Christine Quinn. You have two minutes, Christine. Christine, I've unmuted all participants. Go ahead and speak up if you're online. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Uh, good evening. Um, I'd like to talk about the critical need to replace community court with drug court. As a former social worker, I drug court work. Um, Currently, drug court is only available if you have a felony charge. If you don't have a felony charge, you go to community court at the library. Community court has not been effective. It offers services, they're not mandatory, there's no accountability, and most people don't even show up. Seattle um, has terminated community court because it doesn't work. Drug court works. Drug court offers a highly structured program that combines treatment, education, and intensive supervision to reduce drug dependency. In 2018, Washington State Department of Social and Health Services found that 73% of drug court participants committed no new crimes after 18 months of treatment initiation. Drug court set individuals um, not only don't commit crimes, but it sets them up to be successful in their community. 104 people have died from using fentanyl in the first five months of this year. Imagine a life that would have been saved had drug court been available. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Christine. Next we have Sherry Barnett. And after Sherry, we'll have Sunshine Wigan if she's in the house or online. Council President and all members of the City Council and especially Mr. Zapone, because I live in your district and I went to a meeting. We were told that there was going to be a request uh, to the Planning and Development Service for a change in zoning for what had been a dental lab on the corner of Mansfield and Howard into a so-called mini-mart. And we gave 70 letters. There was not one letter that was approving of this. This particular, okay, first of all, Mansfield is the route where the children go to the elementary school. Howard is the route where they go to the junior high and the high school. They catch the bus for the junior high at the high school and they go to the high school. This, when it was a dental lab, there were very few people. There is not parking all the way around, just a few places in the back. There are bike lanes that are very busy in the summertime. It was a five day a week thing and this will be seven days a week. It will accumulate problems for children who might want to uh, purchase things from there. I, I mean, I believe that we should be treated as well as the South Hill. They put down the um, chicken place that would have been a very nice place and uh, made zoning changes. There's no reason that we should have this. It would be a big problem to a very normally calm neighborhood, especially on the weekends, and for parking and for problem people that will litter and go up and down our alley, which is already a big problem. So let the city be for everyone. Let it be for the neighbors. And also the Indiana market and the smokers outlet, they don't have it so good. Yeah. You could be causing you, them to go out of business. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Sunshine.
Sunshine Wigan, um, Spokane. Uh, like Bingle, I refused to wear a mask. 1993, I said goodbye, Becca, see you later. She left to meet her, John, two blocks away. I was one of the last people to see Becca alive. Me and Becca were 13 at the time. He beat her to death with a baseball bat. That's the only time I ever saw a podium be put in the dirt to fight for us, not against us. We made the Becca bill in honor of her. There was no podiums for Kelly and the others tortured, raped, and burned in the furnace of the new Madison. They hired two homeless people to clean the scene. The scene, after CSI was done, they both committed suicide soon after. There was a sex trafficking ring in an apartment building being ran by four cops. For three years, why city officials turned their heads the other way, hiring homeless men to stand outside and be the lookout around the time of Becca's death. The city finally stopped looking the other way and busted it because the hype of Becca's death, thanks to her family. 30 women were in that apartment building being sold willing and unwillingly. No podium for that. We can't even find it on Google. Unlike the podium, put in Katz parking lot against us. I am a street hooker in LA, Seattle, and Spokane. I am a traveling escort and a cam girl on the internet. I support legalization of brothels like in Nevada. Prostitution has always been and always will be. I keep asking Spokane to put a social worker in place to help Spokane skid row workers. They need to be able to anonymously let you know when the Johns who are killing them who they are. Why, why you put a podium in a restaurant same day one of our girls survived attempted murder and told no one. She Thank was you. beat and drugged by a car. I was injured Thank that you, week Sunshine. and almost kidnapped by two guys. You need to put Sheena Thank from you. the cops. Sheena Thank needs to be down there with us. We trust Thank her. You. We need to be able to tell you guys Next who's up killing is, uh, us. Will Hewling. There's people killing and us then right Justin now. Holler. Will and then Justin. Thank you, Sunshine. Nothing done about it. We have no one to tell. There's a serial killer. His name is Eric. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Will Hewlings, and I live downtown uh, Spokane. Um, I express, I just I was going to speak on this earlier, but you deferred it, so I'm just going to read it. But I express my strong support for the sit and lie ordinance, which expand, or for ordinance C36577, which expands the prohibition of illegal sit and lie activities to all locations within city limits. As someone who has lived, down, lived downtown Spokane, just blocks from City Hall since November 2019, I have witnessed firsthand the devastating impact that chronic homelessness and open drug use have on our community. The building where I live in is constantly plagued by homeless individuals who loiter and openly use drugs in full view of passerbys. It's a daily reality, and frankly, it's a dangerous and unacceptable situation that affects not only downtown, but other neighborhoods across Spokane. Currently, the sit and lie ordinance is limited to the downtown core, but this area is not confined to just one area. It affects neighborhoods and businesses throughout the city of Spokane. By expanding this ordinance citywide, we can address this issue more comprehensively and provide relief to all the communities, not just those in downtown Spokane. Uh, this ordinance aligns with the will of the voters as demonstrated by overwhelming approval of Proposition 1 in 2023. Um, I'm not gonna, you guys got my speech. Um, but anyways, I forgot I have two minutes. Um, but basically, what I'm saying, oh, it's done. But thank, thank you, you, Will. Thank you. Next, Liz Goodwin Oaks. She in the room? Welcome, Liz. Hi, 
there. Hi. Liz Goodwin Oaks from the West Plains. Greetings, Council President and Council Members. I am a Spokane resident residing on the West Plains. Within the past year, I have learned of the contamination of my well and the aquifer that supplies thousands of people. The contamination came about through the use of AFFFs at the Spokane International Airport, which is co-owned by the city and county. There is an inv investigation and cleanup underway by the Washington State Department of Ecology. They inform us affected residents that the liable party, the Spokane International Airport, is responsible for providing water filtration systems for affected homes to filter the forever chemicals or PFAS from our water. This is according to Washington State's Model Toxic Control Act. Your counterpart in the county, Al French, who sits on the airport board with Council President Wilkerson, has come up with a ridiculous idea on how to address this problem. We call it a pipe dream in my house because he wants to put a pipe so big you can drive a car through it to bring clean water in. He proposes placing a huge pipe through the neighborhood, the same neighborhood where we can't get internet fiber because the basalt is so difficult and expensive to drill through. Just as these are forever chemicals, there cannot be a deadline affixed to helping those with contaminated wells, which he is proposing. We need a third party expert to make recommendations on how the airport will deal with the repercussions of this contamination on the community. As the airport is co-owned by city and county, I come here tonight to request cooperation in finding a solution for the contamination and its effects that myself and my neighbors are still coming to terms with. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're going to have Cherry Hill and then Ryo Pena. My last trip up here tonight, I promise. Five years ago, mi amigo Alfredo Yamedo passed away. Alfredo was a sp frequent speaker at this forum, often using some rather colorful language. Setting his language aside, Alfredo was a fearless, passionate, eloquent, and strong voice for many, on many civil rights issues. It's in his memory and with his inspiration that I leave the comfort zone of the back row and speak here at this forum. With my voice beginning to crack and tears welling, I yield the podium. Thank you, Terry. Raul? I'm still Raul Pena. Still District 1. You realize they put in a gas station, Circle K, on uh, Foothills and Hamilton. Traffic is bad as it is. You know, you got cars heading north on Hamilton. It's a speedway. Um, there's only one entrance, and that's if you're coming east on Foothills to get to there. Uh, ain't going to happen. Traffic's gonna be diverted one block over, and in order for them cars to get out of that gas station, they're gonna to have to go down that street to Marietta, Jackson, and the other inlets that there's no traffic lights. You can't get through. It takes me five minutes <coughs> off of Jackson just to turn left to come to this meeting because I'm waiting on traffic to open up. There's, we, I mean, it's ridiculous. Emergency vehicles have a hard enough time because station number two is right there, right off uh, Catholic Charities Family Facilities. Already they have a hard time responding to the needs of the community. And now you're putting in and there's no cutouts from that gas station on Hamilton. And if you put them in there, it's going to be even worse. I beg of you to come down and look at my neighborhood. I've 
I've had three members of this council come down, and I personally gave them a tour. I, I'll invite the rest of the council. You can get my number off Mr. Cascart, off Mr. Bingle. Call me. I will give you a tour of my neighborhood and the traffic and what's coming down our way. There's enough gas stations. There's enough kids that are going to get hit, and I guarantee you, once they do, say she's going to get sued. Thank you, and I'm going to be right there cheering them on and suing also. Thank you. That concludes our legislative agenda for this evening. I'd like to acknowledge Councilmember Dillon, who's joined us from somewhere warm, I believe. So thank you for zooming in. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved. Second. All those in favor of adjournment, please indicate by saying aye. 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 We are adjourned. Aye. We'll see you next Monday night.